Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday rundown of all the latest happenings in spaceflight, SpaceX, Starship development, launch events, and all the best stories around spaceflight from the past seven days. We have loads to discuss today, from the ever-busy goings-on with Starship, an epic Atlas V launch, some Falcon 9 launch insanity, Electron Long March, and more. This video was sponsored by Squarespace, the world's greatest website-building platform. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's begin with all the latest Starship updates. For the past couple of weeks, Booster 7 has been in the Mega Bay, having final upgrades and modifications before being rolled out for its final bout of testing, which of course includes a 33-engine static fire with Ship 24 stacked on top, before ultimately launching on the first ever Starship orbital flight test. And the first ever flight of a Super Heavy. Hey, does anyone here remember when there was supposed to be a hop campaign for the boosters, starting with Booster 3? Dunno, just randomly remembered that fact. Anyway, on Thursday, a self-propelled modular transport was moved to the Mega Bay, along with numerous counterweights, which was a good sign that a Booster 7 rollout was imminent. And on the 7th of October, that's what we got! Starship Gazer caught an early morning shot of the booster's rollout from the Mega Bay, and its cruise down the highway towards the launch area. In addition to these photos, Starship Gazer caught some close-ups of the so-called robustness upgrades, in the form of some new engine shielding and uh, I think someone might have lost their water bottle there. <laughs> I don't know when we're going to start seeing tests with Booster 7, or 8, on the launch table though, as crews continue to work on preparing the orbital launch table for both booster test campaigns. Take a look at this shot of workers testing the hold-down clamp retraction systems, and as eagle-eyed CSI Starbase pointed out on Twitter, there's no light bleeding through, meaning that the interior shielding is nearing completion. An animation of what this shielding looks like, created by Ryan Hansen, is on screen. Take a look at those metal plates being added, which will prevent any explosive force and heat from entering the table around the sides of the hold-down arms. A couple of weeks ago, I showcased Chameleon Circuit's render of how the Starlink Pez dispenser mechanism works, spitting out Starlink V2 satellites from the Starship in a manner similar to an industrial pallet stacker. Well, Chameleon Circuit is back, this time producing this little render of how Starship 26, 27 and 28 will look. But hold up, what's the deal with 26 and 27? Ship 25 is pretty much a clone of Ship 24, at least based on appearances, yet Ship 26 and 27 are just basically silver bullets. Now I know I've covered this before, so I'll keep this short, I promise, but recently we saw SpaceX removing heat shield tiles from Ship 26 and Ship 27's components, giving rise to the theory that they plan on running Starship in an expendable configuration initially, due to the necessity to just get Starlink V2 up and running a satellite that can only be deployed by a Starship vehicle. Look, here's Ship 26's nose cone outside the high bay in all of its bare-bones glory. A mock-up of how an expendable Starship Starlink V2 deployment might look can be seen here, created by the great Sushi Fox Studios. Well, we've got our first glimpses of Ship 28's nose cone and it's got heat shield tiles again! So either these tiles are just here for test purposes, a bit like the heat shield tiles featured on the high altitude flight tests of starships like the SN15, or Starship is going back to being reusable. Ship 28 is definitely the vehicle to watch out for right now, it seems. Starship Gazer spotted this cool little hovercraft parked at Starbase. Maria Pointer, whose work is often featured in space this week, commented that she'd seen this little machine parked at Boca Chica last year as well. I wonder what SpaceX would use this for. One Twitter user speculated that it was for picking up debris from rapidly unplanned disassembled Starship prototypes. Maybe this was wheeled out for picking up fragments spat from the E-Dome destructive test a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I'd be doubtful personally, but I am super curious what SpaceX would use this hovercraft for. What do you think it's doing here? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe if you want so that you never miss a space news update with me. And it really helps support what I do here, and I always do appreciate it. But yes, all systems are go at Starbase. Loads of different prototypes are rapidly coming together, many of which, like the aforementioned expendable Starships, are still a little bit of an enigma. Sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell what some pieces even are. Like, what does that even say? <laughs> so, actually, no, actually, I think I'm getting something. If we enhance the image, it looks like it says Squarespace, who have sponsored today's video. Listen guys, you need a website, and Squarespace, they're here to help you do that. Squarespace turned web design from an intimidating barrier to a streamlined and easy and ultimately pretty fun endeavor. It's super simple. Make a free account and then begin your journey. 
First, tell Squarespace the kind of website you want, then scroll through their massive list of pre-made templates to find the right jumping off point for you, and then, well, the sky is the limit. The templates are not there to restrict you, far from it. They're really there just to be a springboard for your creativity. You can change anything and everything about them to make the perfect website for your needs. It's super simple. In the background, you can see me making a meme portfolio of all the great garbage I post on social media. If you're an artist, designer, small business owner, or anyone really who's trying to make it in the modern era, then a website is an absolute necessity. And why not choose Squarespace? Everything I've shown you up until now is absolutely free. The only time payments are needed are when you're ready to launch. And when that time comes, go to squarespace.com slash matlown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go on, do it now. There has never been a better time than today. Evan Karen blessed us all with a really nice render of a starship being stacked. From the cabin windows present, this sequence is set a little while in the future, and I do love me a good animation from time to time, and I love the sunset backdrop. It gives the whole scene a nice ambiance. There's a card on screen to Evan's channel if you're interested to see more, and see the full high resolution version of this new Starship stack render. So what's in store for Starship testing this week? Well, mariners have been issued a notice of a hazard area in the vicinity of Starbase in view of apparent plans to run tests between 8am to 8pm from the 10th of October to the 14th. So from today through to Friday, we may see some action from either the boosters or Ship 24. Watch this space. SpaceX went crazy with launches last week. Their biggest launch was on Wednesday, my dudes, when they launched their fifth operational Crew Dragon mission to the International Space Station for NASA, and this was their eighth crewed orbital flight overall. This was the Crew 5 mission. On board Crew Dragon Endurance were NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Cassida, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata, and Russian cosmonaut Anna Kikina. She's the first Russian cosmonaut to fly on a US spacecraft since Nikolai Buderin's flight on STS-113 back in 2002, and she's the first Russian to ever fly on a US space capsule. Three of the crew members of the Crew 5 mission were actually originally supposed to fly to the ISS aboard Boeing's Starliner, but were transferred to Crew Dragon due to the delays in the Starliner program. We were treated to a beautiful launch stream. I swear it's been such a long time since we had a daylight Crew Dragon launch, which is always nice to see. And shortly after stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed on the drone ship. And this is kind of a cool one. This was a brand new booster. Kind of a rare sight to see these days. I mean, look at Brooklyn's diagram. It looks so bare and empty. Hopefully we'll see a lot more launches out of this booster and we'll see this infographic get filled out in no time. Now wanting to waste no time at all after the Crew 5 launch, SpaceX launched another Falcon 9 a mere seven hours later. This was on the other side of the country, on the west coast, at the Vandenberg Space Launch Complex. This was another Starlink flight, Starlink Group 429, which saw the rocket place 52 satellites into low Earth orbit. This particular Falcon 9 first stage was Booster 1071, which had previously flown two National Reconnaissance payloads, one Starlink mission, and the SARA-1 military radar satellite launch. It successfully landed on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, bringing a close to its fifth successful mission. SpaceX then aimed to launch another Falcon 9 on Thursday, and things looked good to go. However, sadly, the launch was aborted painfully close to liftoff. Luckily, SpaceX had another go on Saturday this time, and this time the rocket did launch. Hooray! This was the Intelsat G33 and G34 mission, which saw the Falcon 9 place two satellites, the aforementioned Intelsat G33 and G34 satellites, to geosynchronous Earth orbit. These satellites will be used for telecommunications services and will operate in the upper portion of the C-band spectrum. The livestream for this launch was really cool too. We got a really great shot of the space jellyfish from the deck of the drone ship. This is created by sunlight reflecting off the plume of the rocket's exhaust. We also got a really nice view of fairing separation, the two big white blobs to the left of the screen, and to the right you can see the Falcon 9 first stage, which of course would eventually land on the drone ship with its exhaust plume from the launch still visible in the background. Overall, super impressive stream from SpaceX. While still on the subject of Falcon 9, in last week's episode I mentioned the fact that SpaceX and NASA were investigating the feasibility of using Crew Dragon to perform surfacing and altitude boosting missions to the Hubble Space Telescope. I mentioned that the Crew Dragon doesn't have the robot arm or cargo bay that the Space Shuttle had, but a grapple fixture was installed on the telescope during its last servicing mission, so there's potential that Crew Dragon could somehow dock with this. 3D artist Truthful on Twitter created this little set of renders of what a docking with 
with the Hubble Space Telescope and Dragon might look like. And in the reply section, we had a response from Jared Isaacman, commander of the Polaris Dawn mission to space and is heavily involved in the Crew Dragon Hubble Space Telescope investigation. He said that the renders looked good, but it might be better if perhaps the Crew Dragon was rotated 180 degrees. Just a little guess. <laughs> in no time at all truthful amended things and gave us all these renders which is so far the most likely configuration that crew dragon will be docking with the hubble space telescope the key advantage to crew dragon docking in this manner is that it leaves the front hatch exposed so that it can open and allow eva which of course would be an extremely necessary component to a hubble servicing mission now we had a pretty special launch on tuesday this was united launch alliance's av099 mission in which an atlas 5 launched two luxembourgian satellites the SES-20 and SES-21 to geosynchronous Earth orbit. We were initially hoping to see this launch a little bit earlier, at the end of September, but it was delayed due to the threats posed by Hurricane Ian. The launch went very well. The Atlas V launched in its 531 configuration. Now 531 refers to the fact that the rocket had a 5 meter wide fairing, 3 solid rocket motors and 1 RL-10 engine on the centre upper stage. The payloads themselves were, as mentioned, the SES-20 and SES-21 satellites, which are both C-band communication satellites operated by Luxembourg-based telecommunication company SES-SA and built by Boeing Satellite Systems. The satellites weigh in at about 3.5 metric tons each and have an expected lifespan of one year. Wait a second, that's not right. I've written one year on my script, that's right. I've got to just check. And have an expected lifespan of 15 years. They will work with four other SES satellites to provide North America with digital broadcasting services and contribute to the ongoing effort of clearing the lower 300 megahertz to the upper 200 megahertz of the C-band spectrum, which is required in order to fully deploy 5G services to the United States. Congratulations to United Launch Alliance for this mission, their 378th Atlas launch from Cape Canaveral and their 678th Atlas launch overall. On Saturday morning, we saw Rocket Lab make its 31st Electron launch on the It All Goes Up From Here mission. The name is a play on words, but it's also a reference to the rocket's payload, General Atomics' Gazelle satellite, which hosted the Argos 4 Advanced Data Collection System payload. Argos is a global satellite system that collects, processes, and disseminates environmental data from platforms around the world, used to provide a better understanding of Earth's physical and biological environment. Unfortunately, no recovery attempt was made for the Electron first stage. Fully implementing a catch and recovery system for Electron will take some time, so Rocket Lab are probably still working on the logistical side of things for the moment. Congratulations to the team at Rocket Lab on another successful launch. Last week, we had the fourth ever Long March 11 launch from the sea. The rocket launched from an ocean platform in the Yellow Sea on the 7th of October, carrying the Centispace 1, S5 and S6 satellites. Official sources have stated that these satellites will be used to monitor performance of the Global Navigation Satellite System in real time and carry out navigation augmentation and inter-satellite laser communication tests. The platform the rocket launched from was positioned 3 kilometers from the shoreline and the Long March 11's designers have stated that the rocket is now able to be regularly launched from sea. That wasn't the only launch we saw from China last week. On Saturday, a Long March 2D launched the Advanced Space-Based Solar Observatory from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center. The satellite will conduct observations of the solar magnetic field, solar flares, and coronal mass ejections to support the forecasting of catastrophic space weather. Laon Aerospace had another quiet week this week as I have once again been away taking part in the Tour de Moor mountain bike race across Dartmoor. 52 kilometers of mud, sweat, and gears. There'll be a video on my second channel of this at some point, but while Laon Aerospace weren't paying for any rockets, they were constructing their newest theme park, Adventure Woods. First episode came out on Wednesday, there'll be a card to it on screen if you're interested, as well as a list of all my patrons and channel members whose support makes all of this content possible. Guys, thank you all so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye! <laughs>